What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, just welcome. My name is Jenna Jade, but today we're going to be talking about the case of Edith Thompson. Before we jump into our case today, I just want to let you guys know that I have a lot of requests coming in and I want to try to keep everyone happy as much as I can. So what I'm going to do is the old time crime case that I've been doing once a week. I'm going to do once a month now. So this is the last one until next month. The reason I'm doing that is because I can only do two videos a week right now. I keep falling behind. I have so many other things going on that I'm going to talk about at the end of the video. So I would really appreciate it if you would stay tuned for that. There's just so much that I want to do with um, the two podcasts and the astrology, moving everything from Hot Mess to a different channel, um, researching, editing, scripting, uploading, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's literally no money at all coming in right now. So with the holidays and I know with COVID, um, it's really hard for people to donate. And unfortunately, nothing that I'm into right now um, pays out yet. Um, that will come like with the monetization and sponsors and all that but right now there's just nothing and it, it's hard um, I don't have a background you guys know so I don't want to dwell on the negative um, I am getting a little discouraged but um, let's jump into Edith Thompson and I'll talk to you more about that towards the end Edith Jessie Graydon was born in Dalston, London on December 25th, 1893, so a Christmas baby and a Capricorn. Edith was the oldest of five children, and unlike most of the people we talk about in my old-timey cases, I just like saying old-timey, <laughs> um, she had a really happy childhood and a pretty normal upbringing. She loved to act and dance. She did really well in school. She was described as outgoing and sweet with an infectious personality. She had a laugh that was simply contagious and everyone just loved her. She was also very popular in school and when she was 15 years old, she met a 19 year old boy named Percy Thompson. Even though they were total and complete opposites, Percy and Edith started dating right away. Percy was level headed and sensible and Edith was super outgoing, uh, romantic at heart an adventurous. She had, was kind of this kindred spirit while she dreamed of a knight in shining armor from one of her romance novels that she always had her head stuck in to come and whisk her away and take her on these romantic and fantastical adventures to foreign lands. Percy, on the other hand, was dreaming of buying a home right there in Dalston and having a wife who stayed home with the children while he worked and having some kids, a regular suburban dream. But somehow the two hit it off and they fell in love quite quickly. In 1909, Edith finished school and started working for a local clothing manufacturer. In 1911, she started working for a really large hat manufacturer that was still local, but she was known to be enthusiastic and hardworking in everything she did. And she very quickly rose through the ranks of this company. She actually ended up very quickly becoming the chief buyer for this company. And this was a dream come true for Edith because this meant that she would occasionally get to travel to Paris, the city of romance and love, right? On the company's dime because it was part of her job description as buyer. So she got these all expenses paid trips to foreign countries, mainly Paris, because that was the height of fashion back then. Um, and still kind of is, right? I don't know. I don't know much about fashion, but, um, so she was living the dream, you know, all the while she and Percy were dating. And even though she was there on business, this job and these trips to Paris and wherever else did not help to contain her wanderlust and kind of settle her down. Um, Edith was an adventurer and it really fueled her adventurous spirit. And she always visited the capital and the cafes and poetry readings there in Paris. She loved going to the Eiffel Tower. Like I said, she was basically living her dream come true with this job. Percy and Edith got engaged in 1910, and after six years of being engaged, they finally got married in 1916. That's kind of a long engagement, especially for back in the early 1900s. Right when they got married, the couple moved nine miles east of Dalston to a place called Westcliff, which was a really fashionable place to live, so right in line with what Edith wanted and was doing with her life, despite marrying normal old Percy. 
right from the start, however, and I guess it wasn't that evident when they were just both dating and doing their own thing, but once they got married and moved in together, friends and neighbors and loved ones of the couple noticed right away that it really wasn't a good match. Um, Ethel was career oriented and goal oriented and wanted to continue working. She didn't want to give up her job. She did not want children, um, nothing that would interfere with her career. I don't know how she didn't see it coming that maybe Percy would interfere with her career because back then women were expected to basically settle down and all that stuff. So Percy, like I said, he had a conventional job. He was looking to save for a house. He expected her to stay home while he worked the nine to five and take care of all the children, which there would be many in his mind. So maybe these weren't things that were talked about that back then before you married someone. I don't know what the criteria were for marrying someone back then. But nowadays, I would hope that people would discuss these kinds of things before they decide to get married. I mean, one person really wanting children and the other person being adamant they will not have any, that's kind of a big thing, you know, that could have been a deal breaker had they discussed that right from the beginning. Percy, however, told all of these people that were expressing concerns, like their friends, family members, and loved ones, that Edith would eventually, quote, come to her senses, end quote, and give up her career to stay home and keep house and mind the children, and that he would somehow change her mind about this, and also he would was convinced he would change her mind about wanting children. However, as of 1916, when they first got married and were first starting out, Edith was earning way more money than Percy, so they decided, at least Percy thought for the time being, that she should be the primary breadwinner, I guess. Like, they were both working and bringing in money, but because she was making so much and so much more than Percy, that they decided for the time being that she should continue her career, at least for now. In 1920, so four years after they got married, the couple went on a vacation to the Isle of Wight, and... I can't quite figure out why, but they brought along a friend of Edith's younger brother, who was nine years younger than Edith, and his name was Frederick Bywater. I don't know. I, I really did look. It was kind of a rabbit hole as to why this guy tagged along on this holiday or vacation, but he did. So the three of them went to this Isle of Wight and were there for a vacation together. What we do know about Frederick, um, even though, like I said, I have no clue why this random guy who they seem to not even have been very good friends with was on a vacation with them, um, is that he once dated one of Edith's younger sisters named Avis, but that relationship kind of fizzled out very quickly. As I said, he was also a friend of one of Edith's younger brothers. I have such a hard time saying Edith's because I have a lisp, so bear with me. Sorry about that. No need to make fun of me. Um... And he had just joined the Merchant Navy. So maybe this was a business thing. I'm moving on, Gemma. Like, I keep getting stuck on why this guy was there. Sorry. Frederick, and I wish I knew his sign, and Edith got along so well because, you know, he joined the Navy to get out and see the world. He had that same wanderlust ingrained into him that Edith had that Percy did not. But somehow he and Percy did also get along fairly well in the beginning. Frederick would talk to Edith for hours on end and late into the night and early morning about all of the foreign places he was going to visit while being in the Navy. Um, again, he had just joined. He had not yet deployed and he was really excited and Edith would love to listen to him and imagine herself there in these places too. And they would go on these fantastic journeys in their minds together, just the two of them. Edith likened young Fred Bywaters to one of the heroes in her favorite romance novels. That's kind of how she thought of him as this romantic knight in shining armor showing up on a white horse. Percy, for some reason, was actually the one to invite Fred to go and live with them when they got back from this vacation in their new home they had just bought, you know, four years previous when they got married. Percy figured it'd be a good way for them to make some money because he figured Frederick would wouldn't ever be there because he'd be deployed with the Navy or Navy training, whatever he was doing. And he and his wife could still have the house to themselves while also collecting rent from an absentee tenant, which, you know, it makes perfect sense financially. Um, I don't know why anyone would invite someone, especially a younger and good looking person to live with them and in their, ooh, sorry, in their home, um, especially while they're newlyweds, but okay, Percy. 
of course, Frederick accepted immediately, and also, of course, he and Edith almost immediately started having an affair right there under Percy's nose. Again, the information's kind of sketch, but I don't know if it was because Percy actually found out that Fred and Edith were having this affair, or if he just didn't like the amount of time the two were spending together. Like I said, they would talk well into the night, night after night, about all these fantastic dreams that they had, these adventures they wanted to go on together. I mean, I think they really were much better matched for each other, and I really think that they were in love, but she was already married, and we'll get to that. Either way, Percy threw him out very quickly after he had just moved in. Percy and Edith had a really loud and violent fight over him throwing Fred out. Percy seemed to be convinced that after he threw Frederick out that Edith would stop seeing him, they would stop seeing each other. However, they did not and they met every chance they got in secret, again, right under Percy's nose with him being none the wiser. In 1921, Fred went off to sea for about a year and did not return until September of 1922. Edith wrote to him almost constantly while he was away. She wrote about, you know, their plans for adventure and all the things on her mind and her career, but what she most wrote about was her lack of love for Percy and how miserable and just discontent she was in the marriage and that she missed him and wanted to be with him. This was 1920s in England, and while there was a lot more freedom for women in the 1920s than in previous times, divorce would still leave the husband getting everything, including a lot of her stuff, especially there were no kids involved. He would get the house, he would get everything. But on top of that, there was this stigma still attached to divorced women. Even if the man was the one doing the filing, even if the man was the reason he was abusive or he was... Um, a philanderer, you know, an adulterer, he would still get everything. He was the man and the woman would be left with this shame and this stigma and she could have possibly lost her career had she divorced him. And she also wrote to Fred a lot about this as well. I forgot to mention too, please remember what Edith did for a living. She had this job that it was her dream job. I told you she traveled to Paris. She traveled to the United States. She traveled all over. She was involved in high fashion. Um, if she was known as a divorced woman, she would lose her reputation and probably most likely she would have lost her job. And that was actually the main reason she gave to Fred for why she could not and would not divorce Percy and why she did not want Percy to find out about the affair. This is basically why she said she's not just going to leave Percy for him, but she did express her love for him and her wanting to be with him, just that she couldn't. And she didn't know what to do. And she begged him to help her find a solution. This was all in the letters. She wrote in her letters to Fred that he must, quote, do something desperate, end quote. She also told Fred that, remember how conventional Percy was? He was like the white picket fence woman, barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, raising the kids while he went off to work his little nine to five. You know, he comes home and she's holding a martini for him, dressed in, a, you know, her dress, full made up hair. And you guys know what point I'm getting to. So she basically told him like, look, even if I wanted to divorce him, even if I wanted to leave, he would never grant it. And back then the man did have to grant the divorce. No matter what, like I said, um, he could be beating her, which he was, and he could have been cheating, which we don't think he was. We don't know if he was. Um, and he would still have to grant that divorce. So she was pretty much trapped in this marriage. I mean, I always believe love conquers all and that's what's gotten me into a lot of trouble in my life um, to think that if she loved him that much, she should have kind of just ran off and uh, said, forget the reputation, let's move somewhere else. She had enough money that she could have probably gotten the same kind of job. But now I'm just going off in tangents and speculating because I hate when two people in love can't be together. Moving on, Gemma. When Fred returned from his year at sea, he and Edith went right back into having an affair right under Percy's nose. And Percy at this point thought that Fred had been out of the picture all this time. He was like, good riddance. This guy's off at sea. They're never going to speak again. He had no idea that they were corresponding back and forth through letters or what they were talking about, obviously. Um, but they didn't even skip a beat. They went right back into seeing each other behind per good old Percy's back. On Tuesday, October 3rd, 1922, Edith and Fred went to London's Piccadilly Circus to the theater. They just wanted to have a night out. You know, Percy did love her and he did want, but he wanted something that she didn't. He wanted this 
just this stability, this normalcy that she did not want. Uh, again, she had wanderlust. So anyway, the couple were spending some time together. Percy had no idea Fred was still in the picture and they decided that they were going to, they took like whatever a taxi would be back then, um, part of the way, but then they got dropped off and decided to walk the last few blocks to their house. It was a beautiful night. I guess maybe the stars were shining. Maybe Percy thought this might be a little romantic to kind of feed into um, Edith's romantic side. I don't know. But for whatever reason, they did decide to walk home the last few blocks to their house. As they were walking, a man jumped out of the trees completely out of nowhere in the dark and attacked Percy. Percy, of course, fought back. And during the scuffle, somehow Edith got thrown down onto the ground. They were walking home in a residential neighborhood at the time of the attack. So Edith started screaming at the top of her lungs, despite the fact that the attacker did have a knife and was trying to stab and attack Percy. Edith screamed at the top of her lungs, and I guess the attacker knew that eventually this was going to alert either neighbors, no matter how late it was at night, and someone was going to eventually alert the authorities. The attacker eventually ran off um, very quickly after Edith started this screaming. He just left her kind of laying there hysterical and in shock on the ground. But Percy seemed to be the intended target because before running off, the attacker did get in a few stabs at Percy and he did end up stabbing him and hurting him. And it, the attacker didn't touch Edith at all, but Edith was in hysterics. Obviously she just watched some random man jump out of the trees and stab her husband. And it ended up that he did stab him to death because Percy did die of his injuries. Despite all of Edith's desperate cries and screams for help, she was not able to do anything to help him and he died before help was able to arrive. When the police finally did arrive, they started by taking statements from the neighbors, any ear witnesses, any possible eyewitnesses, and of course from Edith herself. Edith was in a state of absolute shock and hysteria. The investigators tried their very best to calm her down and, you know, offer their emotional support. They, they had their arms around her. They were really trying. They felt really bad for her. She had just watched her husband be murdered by some random person for seemingly no, no reason because it wasn't a robbery. The person hadn't taken Edith's jewelry or went through her purse or demanded anyone give up a watch or money or anything like that. The guy just seemed to want to attack Percy. Several neighbors said that they heard Edith or a woman who they now knew was Edith to be screaming no and don't over and over again at the absolute top of her lungs. And she also sounded like she was in hysterics and crying as she was screaming this. Eventually, Edith did calm down enough to be taken down to the police station to give an, an official and formal statement of her retelling of the events of that night. When asked by the police if Edith knew who attacked her husband, she actually stated that she did, and she stated that it was Frederick Bywaters, a man she had been having an affair with, her lover. She said she recognized him almost immediately despite whatever disguise mask he was wearing and the fact that it was dark and he came out of literally nowhere she gave him up right away this led to the police immediately going and finding frederick bywaters and arresting him for the murder of percy thompson when they arrested him this gave them opportunity they arrested him at his home to go in and search the home they found hundreds of letters from edith that she had written to fred while he was off at sea they knew she was having an affair with him because she admitted to it. However, there was a few letters, and I think, say out of like 200 or 300 letters, there were like 10 letters. And in these 10 letters, so not by any means the majority of the letters, and she didn't talk about it all the time, um, it was said that mainly the letters were her droning on and on about her daily activities, her career, her adventures, how much she missed him, blah, 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 blah. But in a, these few couple handfuls of letters, she did constantly tell Fred in these letters that she needed him to help her do something desperate. She needed him to do something desperate. She needed him to help her to quote, be rid of Percy, end quote. She also admitted to him that she had ground up a glass and put it in his mashed potatoes once and fed it to him. But the glass dinner had no effect apparently on, on Percy. And she also admitted to putting some poison into his food at one point, which also had no effect on him. But mainly, 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 it was her kind of telling Fred to please do something, asking him to please do something because she could not get a divorce. And the authorities were st shocked and they were stunned because she had seemed so genuinely hurt, genuinely distraught, 
genuinely shocked and she had given up Fred right away. So they were wondering like, why would she send them to his house knowing that they were going to find these letters? Like what was going on here? That's what it's going to come down to. Do you believe that Edith knew or didn't know that Fred was going to do this? And let's continue on and talk about it. When the police arrested Fred and brought him down to the police station to be properly interrogated, the thing they were mainly interested in were these letters that they had found from Edith because under something called the law of consideration and common purpose, Edith was just as culpable as Fred for the murder, whether she had actually been the one to murder him or not. And under this law, Edith was arrested and charged with murder. Let it be known though that Fred proclaimed Edith's innocence. He said that she had nothing to do with it. She did not know he was going to do it, that she did not manipulate him in any way. She did not put him up to it. It was his decision because he wanted to be with her. He loved her so much and he was tired of seeing her be miserable in this marriage to this boring, lame, and dull guy that she couldn't stand and that didn't make her happy. He knew he could make her happier, blah, blah, blah. But the main thing to get from this is Edith, of course, proclaimed her innocence and Fred did too. So just about three months after Fred had returned from being um, overseas with the Navy, the couple went on trial at the Old Bailey in London, and it was on December 6, 1922, that the trial started, and they went on trial together. So there was no doubt at all, and Fred even um, pled guilty that he had attacked, he had been the attacker, he had stabbed Percy and killed him. The main question here was, did Edith have anything to do with it? Did she put him up to it? Did she manipulate him into do it? Did she ask him? Did she tell him? Did she force him? What, what was Edith's involvement? Because according to her and Fred, she had no involvement. It came as a complete shock to her, which is why her hysteria and shock and devastation seemed so real is because it was genuine. She didn't know. After researching this case and after the rest of what I'm going to tell you, I do in fact I can't say I believe 100% she was innocent because as I say a lot, I believe anyone is capable of anything if the circumstances line up just right. But I do lean more towards her being innocent. Um, maybe that's where she was leading with these letters, but I do think it caught her by surprise and he did it without her knowledge. But anyway, that's my opinion. That is not fact. So let's move on. So Fred stated at the trial, like I said, that he thought she was so innocent and he loved her so much he couldn't bear to see her unhappy anymore and decided to take matters into his own hands without her knowledge. That was his testimony, basically. The prosecution produced these letters that Edith had written to Fred and claimed that it was evidence of her involvement and of her arranging the entire thing. They also brought into evidence some newspaper clippings that Edith had sent Fred in some of these letters. Like I said, these letters talking about this with Percy were just a small majority, but she had sent Fred newspaper clippings and all of the clippings were just random stories about people who got away with murder. The prosecution stated that the underlying tone of all of Edith's letters in general was of a disillusioned suburban housewife who was bored in her marriage and wanted some excitement and adventure in her life. The defense took the same letters and brought to the jury's attention that this was in fact, it was when Edith was speaking of writing herself of her husband, she was simply fantasizing about being the heroine in one of her romance novels where the knight in shining armor, who would be Fred, came in and whisked her away. As I've talked about numerous times, this was a dream of hers. She was like a young girl with these romance novels. And the defense said, that's all this was. This was just her telling a story, her fantasizing and wanted Fred to be a part of that fantasy, which she never actually thought he was some kind of murderer that would make this a reality. And the defense said the underlying tone of the letters was not of a master manipulator, some woman playing a damsel in distress in order to coerce her lover into killing her husband. They said that the, over, the overall tone was of a woman pretending to be a damsel in distress because she was playing out a drama. She was acting as they had done many times before when they would speak night after night, day after day, week after week, month after month, well into the middle of the night and fantasize about running off together and fantasize about being the characters in her romance novels. So this was the defense. This was Edith's defense. I mean, come on, her favorite romance novels, a handsome young Navy man comes and frees the damsel in distress from her marriage to Mr. Worky Worky Boring, right? I mean, I don't know. It sounds legit to me. <laughs> Maybe I'm just naive. 
maybe I'm just a Pisces who loves a good romance novel. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, but it's not over yet. The defense also brought into evidence the fact that Percy's body was exhumed and there was no glass or poison found anywhere in his system, as far as they can tell. Um, and they said that this should further point to the fact that Edith was making up this whole story to play out a romance novel. You know, like I said, the handsome Navy man comes in and saves her and she added this um, to kind of give some seasoning to her story. Um, that And Fred came in and took it all very seriously and acted without her knowledge and got rid of her husband for her. Edith's defense attorneys told her that because the burden of proof lie with the prosecution, that she definitely should not take the stand in her own defense. Edith, however, with her love for acting and her beauty and what she thought was smart and her love for the th theatrical and the dramatic, decided that she could woo the jury um, onto her side and woo the judge and even maybe the prosecution onto her side. And she absolutely insisted and went against the advice of her attorneys and testified in her own defense. Never a good idea, guys. Never a good idea. Edith absolutely loved all the media attention she was getting and couldn't wait for the chance to testify, to be the star of her own show, to give her acting chops some practice, I guess. This did not go according to her plan, however, and obviously she should have listened to her, the advice of her attorneys because while being cross-examined by the prosecution, her answers were extremely inconsistent they were very much contradictory and she came off looking really really bad she kept getting confused she kept getting very flustered and she kept kind of lashing out a little bit showing kind of an angry side that she did not intend to show i promise you as soon as i can and it won't be much longer but why don't you head on over to the podcast i mean a lot of you just listen to this without watching me anyway um steve has a great voice if you know missing persons and mysteries also, go over there if you're not already, which I'm sure almost all of you are. The Denver International Airport, Bohemian Grove, Kayla Berg, and soon to be released, Missing 411 and Fairies. I wrote all of those myself, so I would love to hear your opinion on those scripts that I wrote. Um, just a little more support, guys. A little more in the comments. I would really appreciate it. I'm starting to get pretty discouraged. I mean, it's hard working full time on this and like nothing coming of it i feel like am i wasting my time um and i don't just mean money i mean subscribers i mean um likes comments and people going over to the podcast to support me so big things coming up i'll keep you guys posted on all of it i'm sorry if i was a little off today i just have a lot going on mentally um it was actually a really great couple of days i received some kind of upsetting news today nothing i can't handle nothing nobody passed away or anything but Something that got me a little bit down that I kind of had to deal with. So um, stay tuned for Eric, the disappearance of Eric Lee Franks part one. And that, let me tell you, I tell you that these are wild rides. This one is wild. Contact me if you need to, or if you have any case suggestions. I have like 15 that I have to do right now. So I do them as I take them. Um, or as the research comes to me, if something pops up, gemmajadeyt at gmail.com. And if you just want to see my selfies, um, I just like posting selfies and I like using filters. So they're all on my Instagram. Check that out. I don't even have time to deal with Twitter right now. If you're on there, though, stay on there because I am going to have to deal with that at some point in the future. The more followers I have, the more content I can do. Just like with Patreon, there's only one tier right now. It's minimal $5. You can donate as much as you want or as little as $5 and you will have access access to that content it's going to be pretty awesome um, the things that I have planned so without further ado let me just tell you to be kind to each other it doesn't cost anything especially in times like these the world is crazy the United States is crazy right now okay um, I love you guys so much thank you so much for your support most people these days and since the trial who study this case and see what took place in the courtroom and read the transcripts and all that do believe that without her doing this, that this was the turning point in the case, that she did actually come off as looking innocent and not culpable because especially if that Fred was proclaiming that she was innocent and the defense did a really good job at explaining away everything that she was writing in these letters. But like I said, people who study this believe that this was the move that actually got her in trouble with the jury. They believe that up until the point where she testified, she probably would have been found not guilty. Of course, there's no way to know 100%, but this is what they speculate. 
So essentially she sealed her own fate. And on December 11th, the jury retired to go over um, the case and to decide on guilty or not guilty for both Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters. It took less than two hours for the jury to find Edith and Fred both guilty of the murder of Percy Thompson. Upon hearing the verdict and the immediate death sentence handed out to both her and Fred, she immediately became hysterical. Edith started screaming and fanning herself as though she was going to pass out. And while she was doing this, Fred was screaming at the top of his lungs and throwing his own fit, but he was proclaiming her innocence, proclaiming her innocence right to the very end. So they were both shouting about how she was innocent. She couldn't believe that the jury, after seeing her great show she had put on um, up there on the stand, found her guilty. And they were both sentenced to death, though. Um, this had no effect on the court. Edith was taken to the Holloway prison and Fred to the Penterville prison. Both appealed their sentences and both appeals were denied. During the trial, the press kept a really close eye on Edith and Fred and they were not kind to Edith at all. They were very suspicious of her. They did not trust her. However, for some reason, after she was sentenced to hang, that whole thing turned around and the press began to be really sympathetic to her. And the media and the public actually started campaigning for her to not only not get the death penalty, but for her to be released and exonerated altogether. A petition the press started actually got nearly 1 million signatures for Edith to be released. While this was going on, Fred was continuing to tell anyone who would listen, including the press and the media, the public, whoever would listen, that Edith was in fact innocent and he had acted on his own. He was sorry he ever did it only for the fact that Edith was now going to be hanged because of something that he did and she didn't know about. However, all of this publicity and public outcry over Edith's sentencing and um, her death sentence and her conviction, despite the nearly 1 million signatures uh, petition for her release, it had no effect on the powers that be. And she, not only was Fred's conviction upheld, but so was Edith's. And she was considered still guilty and she was still going to be hanged. Edith's mother, Ethel, even wrote directly to King George V and pleaded for mercy for her daughter, but this was to no avail, and the justice system, it seemed, had made up its mind in this case. On January 9th, 1923, Edith was sedated, led to the gallows, and hanged. Frederick Bywaters was hanged that exact same day at the prison in Penterton, and his last words were him proclaiming Edith's innocence. Even after her execution, Edith, Edith's sister um, petitioned for her sister to be found not guilty. She wanted her sister's name cleared. Everyone really believed in Edith at this time, especially her family, but it was to no avail. Her mother even wrote letters to everyone involved in the prison system she could possibly think of. She even wrote several more letters to King George V himself just to be able to go inside the prison walls and visit her daughter's grave. And she was turned down. The sister was turned down. Edith was guilty, considered guilty in the eyes of the law, no one was to visit her. That was how it was done back in the day. They were buried inside the prison. They literally spent their life. And I guess their bodies spent the rest of their afterlife, I don't know, inside the prison walls. This was just how it was done. And no, the mother could not come visit her daughter. And no to the sister, she was not going to be found innocent and her name would not be cleared. Her mother, Ethel, died and eventually her sister too, never being able to visit her grave or even to know where it was inside the prison walls. 95 years later, the Ministry of Justice allowed for the exhumation of Edith Thompson's body. Her body was then relocated to the City of London Cemetery, where she was put in the exact same grave as her mother and her father, finally back with her family. So that concludes this old-timey criminal, old-time crime case, the last one for the month, because I want to start working on your guys' requests. What do you guys think? I started off like, oh, I know where this is going. They're going to get together and kill the husband, the dull, boring husband and run off together but I don't know like I kind of think maybe she didn't know I think I think she was leading up to kind of manipulating him into killing Percy but he went and did it before she was able to kind of kind of fully reveal her plan and get him to do it I think he acted and I truly believe that I guess 95 percent so let me know what you guys think in the comments do you agree do you disagree do you have more information um what do you guys think let me know I just want to let you guys know that you can still donate through PayPal. I have no donations coming in, um, but it's, it's okay. I know Christmas and COVID, it just makes it a little bit harder for me to be able to find the time 
to research and do everything that I have to do. Um, so I'm going to leave the link for PayPal in the description box, the link to become a patron on Patreon in the description box. Guys, anything you can give would be super helpful for me to be able to just get some help and find some time so I can put out content more regularly. I always do two videos a week, but it's becoming really hard. The podcast, Strange Things with Steve Stockton and Gemma Jade, which I will leave in the description box, a link to the last episode that we did. It's on iHeartRadio and it ranked. So if you guys know what that means, you know that's super awesome. Also, all of my the audio recordings from all of my true crime videos that I've been doing the past few months are going to be put into podcast form by the beginning of February. Um, Steve and I are going to work on that all through January. I'll let you know when it's out. It's going to be called Crime Bomb with Gemma Jade. Crime Bomb, like Time Bomb. So I'm going to put up a picture of what we're thinking about for merch. If you guys have any ideas or designs, please let me know. The merch is not out yet, but I will let you know when it is. And I also just received oracle cards, um, a few different decks of tarot cards, gypsy witch cards, and I have more um, coming. So um, astrology is coming soon as well. There are so many things going on. And also I'm a stay at home mom to a toddler full time, as I tell you all the time. So it is hard for me and having money come in to maybe have someone help me with RJ or whatever, um, just to support me and the channel. So if you have it, PayPal is in the description box that goes directly into my account, pa Patreon, and I'm going to be working on some just for patron content, um, in the coming weeks, definitely. But I only have two patrons right now. Thank you, Willie S and Steve S. Um, thank you to Mark T and Steve S who donated through PayPal. Um, this was all last month. So just for Patreon content coming out and everything that I just said is also exciting. Um, plus hot mess recovery is coming. I'm almost done with that. You guys have to understand, like I get up at three o'clock now, um, just to be able to work. Oh, I did old time crime, not just cause this was the last one for a month. I just want to do more, more than just this. And I feel like if I can only do two videos a week, I don't want it to always be the same thing. I have a two or three parter coming up, the disappearance of Eric Lee Franks. And I'm hoping that either Saturday or Sunday, I will have part one of that release. Also, I have to do my two years and my um, Christmas, little Christmas video that I always do on holidays. So I do have big things coming up. If you go a few days without hearing from me, guys, just know that I do everything I can to get two a week out. I do the podcast once a week and the podcast, we need subscribers over there, guys. There are ads on it, but they can't run. I really need you guys to support me. I know I like, I have such a great rapport and friendship with my subscribers on here. And I know a lot of you are waiting for hot mess recovery to come back. And it is Patreon, PayPal, strange things with Steve Stockton and Gemma Jade in the podcast, all three links in the description box. Support your girl. If you can't do it financially, go on over there and subscribe. Give me a like on this video, a thumbs up, all right? Subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure that notification bell is turned on. And I will see you this weekend, whether it be Saturday or Sunday, and possibly tomorrow for a short Christmas video and an update on the 48 months. Woo! <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Trying to make myself feel silly. A uh, little down today. So, all right. Have your best day. Have your best night. And I'll see you this weekend. Bye-bye.